Welcome back to Climate Change Challenges and Solutions. It's the final week, week eight. We've been looking at the long-term legacy of human activities for the climate in what we're calling the Anthropocene, and also what we can do in our own lives to reduce our carbon footprints. Um, I know many of you are feeling that the course might be a bit light on climate change solutions, so I hope we cover some of that in this final feedback video. But uh, welcome back, guys. I hear you're referred to as the three T-shirts <laughs> <laughs> nowadays. There's only one of you wearing a T-shirt. <laughs> but let's start with you, Chris. Okay, what, cool. what kind of questions are coming in this week? Um, so people have been calculating their carbon footprints from um, the oh, yeah. energy website, and um, they get a nice value at the end, or not so nice in some cases. Uh -huh. They wondered how that compared to, say, what they should be getting as a target and how low great. they need to get down. OK, to. great question. So we, let's think about this. There's 7 billion of us on the planet um, at the moment. And there's maybe about 10 billion tonnes per year of carbon emissions. Uh, we call that, this unit here, billion, this is a billion tonnes of carbon, a gigaton. And that's per year. So the average um, person on the planet is, em is emitting a bit over one uh, gigaton of carbon per year. I guess uh, 1.3-ish. 1, 1 so a little bit more than, uh, let's call it 1.2, 1.3. Um, I think if people have been doing the calculations here in Britain, for example, uh, many of us might get a number that's more like uh, 10 than 1 yeah, <laughs> or 8. Seven or um, yeah, now if we look ahead then, um, we think about 2050, um, there's going to be more of us. We went over that in one of the previous feedback videos. It's, it's, it's pretty unavoidable that there's going to be 9 billion people. Um, what we would really uh, like to achieve if we want to stabilise climate change and say keep it at within two degrees of warming from pre-industrial, that means we need to more than halve the emissions of uh, carbon from what they are now. So let's say we need about a 60% um, reduction. We need to get down to four-ish, uh, let me write it out in full, uh, billion tonnes of carbon per year, something like that. So you can see that um, each person on average on the planet needs to get down to less than half a um, tut, 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 half a ton of carbon per year. Apologies for getting carried away with the G's there. So um, let's imagine we're in the UK and we're at seven tons of carbon each uh, per year in the way we're living now. Well, if we wanted to be like an equitable citizen on the planet even today, we've got a massive task ahead of us um, in the rich countries. And if we want to be a, an equitable citizen of the planet in the near future, my, we've got a heroic task ahead. We're going to have to reduce our individual um, carbon emissions, if you like, by a factor of 10 at least. So that's a radical transformation of our um, whole way we generate energy essentially and we'll get into also how we have to change our sort of material cycling as well. Um, so that's the kind of magnitude of the challenge. Uh, I suppose at the same time there's kind of <coughs> another side of the coin that there must be a lot of people in the world who have a carbon footprint far below that um, global average exactly. and deserve a chance to be able to... Exactly. Um, and then it's a moot point uh, and a source of much um, international debate whether it's fair on those people to say, well, you can come up to what we're doing now, what the average person on the planet's doing now, you can come up to one tonne of carbon per year, uh, but you're not allowed to go up to what we're, how we're living now, which is seven or or nine. So that's um, so that's 2050 um, two degrees C target uh, world here with those kind of numbers. But if we had 2050, I don't know, uh, what should we call it? Um, re uh, uh, business as usual or aspiration or whatever. And we 
if we believe some figures out there, which is that about four of these nine billion people come up to uh, rich Western levels of consumption. So we've still got our nine billion people, but we're trying to guesstimate, well, what could emissions be if we just keep burning those fossil fuels and then <coughs> consuming more? Well, um, four billion people on maybe seven tons of carbon per person per year, that gets us up to 28 um, billion tons of carbon per year, just there. Then the other five billion people, they're not consuming nothing, and they might be consuming one ton of carbon per year by then. We can easily exceed um, 30 billion tons of carbon per year if we're going in that consumption direction. Wow, I mean, what a difference. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's a factor of uh, seven or eight right there in emissions. And that, I, that of course, that makes a profound um, difference to the future climate, which maybe we should carry on with in a minute to look at what those, what those differences would be. And this one says, there's a, we asked for live questions this week. Can we have yeah. one from someone called Alan Heyman, who says, quite simply, his question is, shouldn't the human race be striving to get better rather than bigger? And I think... <laughs> <laughs> We've discussed before that we don't think that there's much option to stop getting bigger in the near future, but we certainly need to be getting better. Well, <laughs> there's not much option to stop getting more numerous, uh, but luckily that is going to stabilise at a 9 billion. But I couldn't agree more. We definitely need to be getting better in some sense and do, doing things differently. Um, I couldn't agree more. Maybe we should play out. I have to rub this off, but uh, maybe we should just have a quick look at what what would is it, what does this difference mean between the between the sort of low carbon world and the business as usual high carbon world? I mean that's what we've been trying to cover with this the uh, thinking about the Anthropocene concept this week as well. But because uh, what we're thinking about is on the one hand you have you know we, we've just been talking about um, emissions of of carbon globally, let's say, in gigatons of carbon per year um, coming from 2014 forwards in time. And well, they're definitely on and up. They're about, I know, it's about 10 now. So that's where we are roughly today. Well, where we want to be for 2 degrees C in 2050 was to get them down by 40% or so and then they have to carry on down so we have to have some sort of downward curve like this <laughs> and we saw that with our um, with our business as usual we're actually going we're shooting off up here somewhere we then have to do a translation step we have to translate from emissions into concentrations of carbon and into temperature change um, but if we're thinking about CO2 concentration, parts per million in the atmosphere, where are we now? About 400 is the current level. So we're at 400 and some or so. But we could be basically on the, on the high emissions trajectories. We're going out maybe to the end of the century, just looking to the end of the century to begin with here. Um, high emissions, I should have given my colours a... Uh, go. I'm going to colour the good world in green and I'm going to colour the, the business as usual in red, I think. Um, if we go, which one should we do first, chaps? Bad news or good news? Do the bad news. Do the bad, deal with the bad, get the bad get news. The so we'll get it out of the way. <laughs> All right, we're starting here. If we're going on this kind of um, business as usual, and that really does go up to 30 more billion tonnes of carbon per year later this century, then it's going on up to, well, who, probably something like uh, over a thousand parts per million of CO2 at the end of the century and probably on a, something like an upward curve. And we can do the temperatures for that in a minute, if you like. And the good news story is still going to have to, because, because this is still an input of carbon to the atmosphere, the concentration is still going to rise to begin with on the green trajectory, not as quickly. It's going to sort of top out maybe at 450-ish, uh, maybe a bit higher, 
500 ppm and the hope is that if we keep reducing emissions to zero we can get the concentration here to stabilize hopefully at less than 500 ppm less than or equal and up here we're going way off to great way greater than a thousand probably oh, more than that certainly I guess those could also go negative as well, couldn't they? Our oh, that's a good like point. So we had the geoengineering video earlier in the course, which is about the idea that we might have to actively remove carbon from the atmosphere and we might have to go down below the axis if we want to stay within this canonical two degrees of warming. So if we do that, that's really the only way that we might be able to bring the concentration back down later in the back end of this century. And I guess we want to just have a think about, just have a rough idea of what the temperatures are for, for this, these scenarios. Um, well, the, we're at about one degree or just under of, of global warming at the moment. Um, and the good news, good news or bad news first? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to run out of scale here, right? <laughs> well, the bad news, the bad news is five, well, four plus degrees of warming in 2100. So, boo, and maybe five. So that we don't have a, pres so the bad news trajectory is going off. Maybe I'll draw it opening out because it's a bit uncertain. But the bad news trajectory is going off to four or more degrees of warming. The good news, the good news trajectory, good within reason. The initial warming, unfortunately, is quite similar because it's kind of controlled by slow heat uptake by the ocean and stuff. But it's basically hovering and flattening out and is trying to stay below about two degrees of warming. And if we got that carbon removal going, we might, we might in the back end of the century, start to bring it down a little bit. So that's a radical, that's already by the end of this century, a pretty radical difference in future worlds, right? And my kids are still going to be alive in here somewhere if they have a normal, healthy lifespan. They might even be alive here at 2100 because they're quite young right now. So are they going to be living in, the question, the question we're kind of deciding for them is whether they're going to be living in a four or five degree warmer world or a two or less degree warmer world and those worlds are completely completely different yeah i think this links in quite nicely with a question uh, louise graham asked on uh -huh. the future land discussion board um about tipping points you mentioned Ooh. the west antarctic ice sheet possibly tipping in one of your videos this week right um, what other key uh, tipping points could we have and what are their probabilities of tipping Ooh, based on these two different scenarios that's a great great question i mean the tipping the different tipping points i probably shouldn't start drawing maps of the world but we never know but if we try to align the kind of candidate tipping points where do we think they are in terms of temperature rise here very roughly well it's the worrying thought is that say melt of the greenland ice sheet might be somewhere around here at two degrees of global warming um, that we commit the Greenland ice sheet to melting down. In fact we can't rule out that that threshold is lower down and, and that we're close to it now. There's a kind of an error bar on it. Um, the same, we're losing the Arctic summer sea ice uh, in this region of temperature rise already. Um, now there are then some thresholds which we think are further away but frankly we have a bit of an error bar on them so things like the dieback of the Amazon rainforest is somewhere up here probably if we go to the to the three four degree warmer world um, uh, El, El Nino disruption or whatever we want to call it um, up probably up there somewhere uh, West Antarctic ice sheet fantastic question it should take about um, five degrees of warming around Antarctica to, to really just break up the ice shelves that protect the ice sheet there. But to get that, we're not, it might need five degrees of global warming or it might need less depending on the polar amplification of warming. So your West Antarctic ice sheet is probably um, somewhere up here. But I think 
without having gone through all the tipping points, and I can throw some more on if you ask me to. Oh, right. So that's, that's a progressive one, but I think we would basically lose the, meat, the tundra and therefore get all its methane in these kind of scenarios. So we've got a methane release is sort of complete up here somewhere. I think the point is, well, clearly if you go from the green trajectory to the red, well, if you go from the green future, the low carbon future to the red, the high carbon future, you're adding on a whole list of potential tipping points with serious damages associated with them. The slightly sobering news is that even if we hold the line at two degrees of warming, we can't rule out that we're still committing quite long term but large changes in say losing the Greenland ice sheet and transforming the Arctic. And we can say that with beca partly because we can look at the gap between the last two ice ages when we know uh, because of changes in the Earth orbit there was a time which was almost was one and a half maybe two degrees warmer globally when we had a massive shrinkage of the Greenland ice sheet and a profound loss of Arctic sea ice. So we're not just speculating on the basis of models here. And by the way, the sea level went up to about 9 to 10 metres higher then. <laughs> so I'm afraid even 1 to 2 degree warmer world, if you played it out, it wouldn't happen by 2100. But if you, if you stay there, and it's, hard, and it's hard to bring the temperature back down, if you stay up there for a thousand years or so, then um, you could well be in, you know, still approaching 5 T 10 metres of sea level rise in the long run and you have a very different Arctic. So that's a different world already and we're going to have to do some adaptation to cope with that in the long term. But this is, this is the shit hitting the fan, basically, uh, to put it impolitely. I mean, this is... My, the way I look at this is uh, these, these things kicking off uh, are going to at some point stop business as usual continuing. I don't think it's tenable that we will be able to operate and proliferate our consumption in the way we currently are as we start disrupting the climate system to this extent. The, the impacts and the social and political repercussions will just become too, too great. Sure. So, so, what for incentives, sorry. <laughs> so what incentives are there for businesses to Acting at more green. Aha, uh -huh. solutions. Yes, we're back on diagnosing the problem <laughs> again. And that's because climate scientists have got very, very good at diagnosing the problem. So, yeah, well, let's talk about, let's think about solutions. Let's, so, we, so, we should rewind to the, basically the difference. We frame the difference between these worlds as a radical difference in, in carbon emissions, which essentially means a radical difference in how we. Um, fuel literally our societies with energy and the forms of energy um, and clearly to get from one to the other we've got to affect some kind of transition from high carbon fossil fuel intensive energy generation to a low carbon energy system. Some people s will say that that might be possible with still burning fossil fuels as long as you capture the carbon and store it at the point of combustion but that costs money right? It's thermodynamics uh, inefficient. You've got to expend some energy to do that. Either that, or we transform, obviously, to renewables and possibly nuclear as 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 essentially low carbon or carbon-free forms of energy generation. And at the bottom line, how are we going to do that? Well, we got to at some level put a price on carbon dioxide as a pollutant. We have to recognise that. This, po this po particular pollutant has very long lifetime in the atmosphere, actually longer than nuclear waste, a fraction of it, the lifetime in the atmosphere, and it has these profound climate consequences, these profound damages that it's going to cause. So we ought to be penalising ourselves, if you like, for emitting this long-term damaging substance, which is what we do for other forms of more localised pollution. We we put a cost on, if you're going to emit that pollutant, you're going to have to pay a, a fee to society for the damage that's going to cause. And that sometimes gets described as a carbon tax, but really we should think about it more generally as just a cost on carbon emission, which is kind of a cost encapsulating the long-term damages it causes. And the basic idea is 
if we can ingrain in our social economic system a, a s vaguely sensible value for that cost of carbon, um, it will help at least, um, it, and we hold the line on that cost, it should help force a transition to lower carbon forms of energy generation. Now what that cost should be set at is a topic of great debate and will of course and whether it's fixed for, for long periods of time will have, make a profound difference to whether it's effective. But that is a sort of blunt instrument that I think is needed. So for a lot of people on a sort of more individual or personal level, these kind of different trajectories are associated often with our kind of our consumption of stuff in the model, modern world, yeah. the kind of lifestyle that we have. Yeah. Um, and these kind of different features seem to demand a kind of a change in the way that we see our relationship yeah. with consumption of resources. Exactly, Tom. I mean, the funny thing for me is I think the energy side of the problem is, is very solvable. I think we have all the alternative sources of energy we could wish for, and we've in a sense pretty much developed the technology. Okay, we can make it better and cheaper, but for me the energy problem is a s transforming from carbon intensive to a carbon zero energy system, the technical engineering side of that, okay there's more work to do but it's essentially done, it's a social and economic and political challenge to, for, to kind of effect that transition. Um, what is a deeper issue I think is we need to go from, we need to go from an economy or a mentality where we basically uh, dig stuff out of the ground, combust it or whatever and dump the waste products in the atmosphere into the ocean or back into the land. I mean that's what S, S society or human society is, is geared up to do at the moment and that obviously isn't long term sustainable especially if this container of stuff in the ground has got a finite size and it is going to run out eventually if this is the fossil fuels or it could be, um, it could be rock phosphate in the in as well uh, several examples of finite resources uh, you can't you know you, you're going to first of all you're going to use that up and also not a smart strategy to just dump your waste products into the environment because this container is finite it's called the planet but it is a finite size and as we're seeing here letting this co2 build up in the atmosphere and some of it go into the ocean uh, well it's raising the temperature in the atmosphere, it's acidifying the ocean. It's just one example of a material thing and an approach to materials which we've got to get beyond. So I tried to think about, right, we changed the energy source in the future, for sure, but we still, and that, that's, that's got to be done, that's crucial, but we would still be in trouble if instead, for example, we didn't transform our behaviour with respect to something else like phosphorus in rocks which is also finite. If we just inefficiently bung that on the fields and wa let it wash into the ocean or, what or whatever, we'd a, a we'd eventually run out of it and we'd cause a lot of ecological carnage along the way. So what I think we need is we need to basically go to a material recycling uh, economy so yeah, we might still have small inputs of stuff into this system, but instead of pouring out our waste products into the earth system, our surroundings, we basically need to do as much recycling of the material stuff we've already got in the social economic system, and that could be iron, it can be phosphorus, it can be lots of other things, um, and minimise what's leaking out into the rest of the earth system. And uh, there's nothing, you know, that's entirely doable. It takes some energy to materially recycle stuff. So let's say, I don't know, let's take the example of iron. And I want to, I'm not going to just let my, um, my uh, rusty old bike go in the landfill. I'd like to recycle that. Well, actually, it's, yeah, it's going to take some energy to remake that steel into some other steel product. But it takes actually a lot less energy for iron to remake stuff out of existing uh, steel stuff than it does to mine uh, increasingly poor iron ores here down in the ground and uh, try and make new things out of it. So for iron we're already seeing the emergence of a recycling steel, we're seeing the emergence of a recycling economy 
for energetic reasons more than anything else. But I think for phosphorus and for a whole load of other stuff, we are essentially going to have to also switch to recycling. And we'll, we'll be using, the. I'm pretty sure we'll be using a mixture of the energy of the sun here to fuel this thing and maybe uh, some nuclear energy, which is stars are nuclear reactors, so they're not so different at some level. And we'll have to devote a chunk of that energy to material recycling. But we won't need to use all of it, only a fraction of it for material recycling. And the rest we can use to, in this case, to enjoy the bounty of energy and electricity to light the world or whatever we want to do with it. Um, because as long as it's long-term sustainable energy, no problem. Energy is not a bad thing; it's a wonderful thing. And if you don't, if you don't have it, you know that, that you know that's the truth. So the idea is we can still uh, sort of achieve a, a good standard of living and perhaps even the economic growth as long as we decouple from yeah, the yeah. endless use of resources and waste product. In, in fact, I'd like to. I, I'm an optimist at heart. I know people are asking on on the uh, Facebook and that is 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 t Tim, are you an optimist? optimist or not. I'm a kind of, when I think scientifically like this, I'm an optimist that this is, so, this is doable. We could have, we could have in the society here, this could still be billions of people. I'm not going to speculate on how many of, um, billions. To be honest, long-term po population could be almost any number you like. Um, and if we pursue a development pathway globally that's a bit like what we've already done in Europe and the West. We actually see um, the average couple going to less than the replacement rate with their kids. So you end up with a long-term population decline because, uh, because for whatever reasons culturally um, we don't reproduce as much when we have a good well-being or we're well off. So, you know, I, I don't mind. I think there's, you can make the system work with loads of people on the planet, renewable sustain and sustainable energy sources, lots of material cycling, and it sh ought to be, this, to be honest, should be the, anth the kind of Anthropocene that we're trying to get towards, um, rather than the kind of one we're busy creating now. Because it's this kind of Anthropocene, there'll be a long interval in Earth's future history, if you like, Whereas this kind of Anthropocene is likely to crash and burn within um, a few centuries and be like a, a blip in the future geological record. So a lot of people have kind of latched onto this idea of the Anthropocene and there's an idea that it gives us a kind of enormous responsibility um, to dictate our future. I think that really comes across with this kind of... Thing. Yeah, yeah. What I'm trying to convey here is this idea that... Um, that, uh, that our actions now and the generations alive now are making choices, implicit or explicit, that are going to make a profound difference to the future of all human generations to come. <laughs> and it's not a totally bleak picture. There are, there are imaginable or, or understandable futures which are long-term sustainable, like I said, they could support billions of us, happy, healthy, high quality of life, I hope. And the technological side of that, I, I believe, is, is doable. But I'm not going to pretend that the social, economic and political dimensions of it are easy. And that's maybe where I'm less optimistic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some really nice ideas coming through about um, the importance of things at a community level, like transition towns and experiments on Great. that scale with how we yeah. use resources and local economies and things. Um, so there's a, a lady called Jacqueline Fletcher is asking whether we think that's a kind of an extremely important um, thing to try and encourage people to join in with on a sort of community level. I do. I think that... Um, if we look at just human history and we understand the revolutions that have occurred just in human history, and the most obvious one is the Industrial Revolution, and the one before that was what's called the Neolithic Revolution, or basically the start of farming. Um, each of those are revolutions in the energy s input to society, generally increasing it, and they're revolutions uh, it, as a consequence, they become revolutions in how we organise societies, the social, political dimensions of that. So after farming, we get the first cities and city-states. After the Industrial Revolution, we get much more energy into our societies and much more differentiated societies. And this future, 
whatever you want to call it, solar, nuclear, whatever, future with its material recycling is, is, is a revolution in the same sense of the industrial revolution. And it's hard to believe that that wouldn't be accompanied by some kind of profound change in social organisation. Um, and so I am a enthusiast for the fact that people are starting to socially organise in, in new and sometimes familiar ways to wrestle with these problems. I don't have a crystal ball and I'm not quite sure what the future you know, society and politics and governance looks like for this sort of world, but we could be in some ways fairly to, we should ought, ought to expect that it needs to be somewhat different and I think it, it doesn't take a genius to to see the limitations of our current socio-economic political system even our much cherished ideals of democracy inverted commas with their five-year election cycles are currently failing us on what is arguably the most profound um, challenge for us as a species so yeah I suppose that highlights a kind of uh, a difference between this needed revolution and the previous ones in the, in the industrial revolution or even the Neolithic yeah. revolution there was a very obvious kind of economic benefit to going through those transitions or they benefited well of society. I don't know you, you yeah I mean that's how we perceive them when we look back with the benefit of hindsight or history we we would we would see those as sort of inevitable and all me immediately beneficial but actually at the time I suspect it all felt quite accidental and in the case of farm, the first farmers it wasn't at all obvious that what, to the majority of people who are hunter-gatherers it wasn't at all obvious that it was a good idea to farm because the farmers at the time were working an awful lot harder than the people harvesting nature's bounty around them and they thought they were bonkers I think probably if I could re had a time machine and I went back that's what I'd expect to see but yeah now now we are more collectively aware, shall we say, of the situation in a way we've never been before, not even at the Industrial Revolution. And so we're collectively trying to cogitate on, imagine or even design these futures in a way I don't think we were even at the Industrial Revolution. I think that was a very opportunistic transition. Thomas Newcomen invented the first steam engine. Within a century we were, you know, we were powering vehicles with the steam engine as well as pumping out mines and trucking coal around our glorious country and and the rest is history you know um, this time who's to say what the innovation will be that's going to tip start tipping the balance and start whatever this solar revolution or whatever it is looks like so you know all power to people who are experimenting with different ways of doing things informed by this bigger picture and out of that who know, you know, some, I, I hope, my optimistic side hopes that some interesting things are going to bubble up. Yeah, and grow. I noticed an interesting call from the, the government, um, or I got an email in my inbox yesterday about a workshop bringing businesses together yeah. to look for opportunities in a recycling economy, so yeah. there's clearly some momentum going towards that kind of thinking. Which I mean, it, yeah, and it's fun. easy to be a lefty environmentalist and think that big business are the problem but actually my experience with the with entrepreneurial people is that they and they when they get this stuff they want to be the agents of change and the people who made the industrial revolution were obviously great entrepreneurs basically so I actually think that innovation and entrepreneurship is probably going to be key to getting this thing going and the problem that, that, that the innovators and the entrepreneurs of today have is, a, frankly, a lack of, of good governance and solid and long-term governance from, from the government. So if I was to point, I'm afraid if I was to point the finger anywhere in, in my, the social context I know, the UK, I would say, I think government, good, God bless them, they're, they're sort of getting up to speed on this, but they need to show much stronger leadership to set the long-term playing field here to put the cap put the cost on carbon that's going to be held they're going to hold the line on that for decades to come so business knows that everybody knows that we've changed the ground rules and then let's go then you'll see the entrepreneurship flourish and then you'll see things starting to happen so uh, instead of kind of wibbling around wondering what's going to get as elected in five years or whatever or what the public thinks of our latest crazy policy or whatever on short term whatever we got to have somebody has got to step up to the plate and show the kind of political leadership that just 
uh, across party, in fact, in this case, in the democracy in the UK, just sets the sets the playing field, leaves it unmovable. You know, no one, in, no future government's allowed to fiddle with it, and then let's go. You know, then wait, wait and see what happens. I've got a couple of questions on Twitter actually. Yeah. So I'm going to say them both, and then you can answer them. So. I mean, in this course, we talked a lot about the transdisciplinary nature of climate change, but we've mostly done that in the science side. So yeah. some people are wondering what role the arts and the humanities have in climate change. Oh, and I my second question. Uh -huh. I'll say that quick. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, okay. What could, if you had one piece of advice or thing for everybody on the course to do, what, what would it be? What, what, what should they do? Oh my word. <laughs> um, let's talk about the arts and the humanities. I think, as is very clear from our final feedback video, we're kind of in the business of telling stories about the future, stories about different kinds of futures. The, this is an apocalyptic future, frankly, and it's a story that's almost too easy to tell. We like, weirdly, culturally, we like to sort of make the movie or tell the story of the apocalypse. This is clearly the, well, this is the revolutionary future um, there's another narrative or story out there, which is the one of retreat, basically, that, the, that I, I would say environmentalists are most fond of. The idea that we're just going to sort of, we all ought to back off, consume less energy, less materials. And, and that has no wider social traction at all, unfortunately, despite my having sort of signed up to it for much of my life. I can see that, that that's going nowhere as a, a story. But the arts humanities point here is that this ha if if we're going to make if we're going to make the difference between these future worlds we have to completely culturally express and internalize that it has it is about stories about the kind of future we want to live in and and you, those will not have um emotional impact and compel people um to do to live in a different way unless unless you have the full force of our kind of of a of a of the culture behind it. If it came, if it comes from people like me, of scientists and technocrats, it just doesn't have the impact that, that it's going to need. So it's got to be completely cross-cutting. And I, I would actually suggest that that might mean that there are art, arts, the humanities, and the cultural dimensions of this are more, are now becoming more important than the scientific in a weird way. I mean, there's a lot. Of, there's always a lot of work to do on the scientific front, but it's the translation of these sort of scientific versions of a future into something that really hits people. That's that, that's still waiting to be done. Oh, the other question was that: what what should we all? What should we? What's the first thing all to do in one's own oh, life? Yes, if, if everybody could do anything. Uh, sit down with a beer or whatever your preferred um, vice and or um, pleasure, and have a think about where do you get, where do you experience quality of life um, and ask yourself if that really um, amounts to high levels of consumption, to going shopping or sitting in a traffic jam or whatever. Maybe it does and therefore this is bad advice, but, um, but actually if you find that, you know, um, cycling uh, on a sunny day or, or going for a walk in the woods with the kids or on the beach, uh, I love the beach with my kids, and then just think about the connections there, think well does, does, does what I actually, re what, does what I really love doing have to mean this, big, this massive pile up of carbon emissions and climate disruption collectively? Uh, in my case it doesn't and I'm hoping that when other people do that uh, they also think find that it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah, we want energy, but we can get that in sustainable ways anyway. So, yeah, that's not a single practical action. But I, if it was, it was probably walking, cycling, or, or spending lots of time chilling on the beach because <laughs> they're all very low carbon. <laughs> so I think that's a nice way to sum up our discussion. Actually, it seems to be. Like yes. Do I manage to answer the question of whether I was an optimist or not? Well, I'm perhaps you'd like to sort of give us a sort of final message on... <laughs> <laughs> are we going to be okay? <laughs> are we going to... Ah, so I remember. So some people ask, are we going to be all right? And I can't tell you that, and neither can anybody else, because uh, we're going to decide whether we're going to be all right.
if you're taking the course, fantastic, because you've now got some feel for the territory here and, the, and that it really matters how we live now, how we all collectively live now. But it's the choices we make about that that will determine whether we're going to be all right or not. If we carry on with what we're doing, and I don't exclude myself from that, then we're on the red curve over there, and I don't think we're going to be all right. But if we start to change and exciting things start to happen um, and they gather their own momentum, then we could be wonderfully all right. Um, we could be all right for many, 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 many generations to come. And we'll be these long term, so our, our descendants will be, you know, citizens of the planet for, I think, thousands, perhaps even millions of years to come. So we could be all right, and it's up to us. And we'll end, I think, on that. Uh, philosophical note. Thanks for being a part of the course which has been a, a pleasure to teach and I hope you've enjoyed learning with us and thanks to uh, Chris, Steve and Tom for helping out along the way and behind the camera <laughs> we've got some people hiding so and behind the, the microphone so yeah Ollie, Jack and Rob who you haven't seen are doing a great job and Mike who's in the background telling us that time is up as well. So I uh, hope to see you again on for some future learning. So just as an epilogue, I know many of you have been asking how can we keep this uh, stimulating discussion going and there are several things. Firstly, the Facebook group is going to stay alive and I'm sure well from, from beyond the end of the course. Um, we know from Future Learn that the course materials are going to stay live on the platform at least for several weeks, so though we're still waiting to hear uh, f for exactly how long, and I guess we'll let you know when we know. Um, and beyond that, I know a lot of you have been asking, oh, where can we read more, find out more? So in my blog, I'm planning to uh, bring together a bunch of suggestions for further reading or finding out material, uh, which I hope to post uh, to hopefully today. And um, you never know your luck. I may well keep keep blogging into the near future. So um, let's keep the uh, momentum of the interesting learning community that's come together on this course going. And I'm sure we'll I'll meet some of you in the future through that. <laughs>